Hi guys and welcome to Quick Guys from Medicine. My name is Vitam, an assistant professor in a hospital here in South Carolina. On this channel, we talk about medicine and topics around medical education. So if you're into that, feel free to subscribe and hit the notification button so you get the videos as we upload them. Today, we're going to be talking about CHF. We're going to talk about CHF from the perspective of an admission presented to the ED with a science consistent with CHF. And we'll go through all of the steps that we would take from that point onward to being able to differentiate the two types of CHF uh, at least the two main types of CHF, uh, heart failure specifically, uh, and then we'll go into all of the different treatment strategies that we would explore uh, to get the patient what they need. So as you see here, obviously, you know, the first thing you want to establish is the diagnosis here, clearly uh, CHF. Um, how do you identify CHF? You obviously start with the initial information that you gather, all right? from history and workup. Shortness of breath, leg swelling, you know, orthopnea is a better description of the shortness of breath that is more consistent with um, heart failure. Um, rails on exam, all right, that's an exam finding. You can say, you know, also leg edema, which also represents the leg swelling on exam. Chest x-ray with pulmonary vascular congestion um, is also indicative of a, of a heart failure diagnosis. Um, the important thing to think about in heart failure is it's, pre it's pretty much a clinical diagnosis uh, because you don't necessarily need, need other lab workup per se. Um, but if you had to do any lab, uh, this is a lab that will, uh, BMP will uh, be very useful. In some places it will be pro-BMP, right? Elevated. BNP or pro BNP will be indicative of a, of heart failure um, a process, especially if it's much higher than their baseline. Um, we're talking about whether patients have a history of it or it's new onset. But anyways, these are the information you need. First of all, to say we're dealing with heart failure, all of this, that you can look at these as disease identifiers ultimately. And then we'll go further and say, okay, so you identify these uh, 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 components of the disease entity, and now what do you do? Uh, initially with heart failure, the more important thing is, you know, we're talking about in hospitalized patients is uh, symptomatic control. And that's mostly achieved with diure diuresis. Uh, but some of these patients may also be in some form of uh, um, respiratory failure. So you also have to ensure respiratory support. Uh, unfortunately, we can say that these patients, some of them may also be in, you know, hemodynamically unstable. Hemodynam hemodynamically unstable. All right. So these patients will probably have to be on some um, type of uh, support, whether medication wise, like with uh, um, uh, uh, ionotropic agents. All right. But for the most part, they're not. This is this is just a consideration. You know, if, if you're dealing with like, you know, critical heart failure patients. But anyway, symptomatic control, respiratory support, hemodynamic support, um, uh, you know, whether with pressors or ionotropic agents. But ultimately, you still have to know what kind of heart failure you're dealing with. And the first thing you have to do to delineate from just regular heart failure to the specific type of heart failure will be the 2D echo or transthoracic echocardiography. And that typically tells you the left ventricular ejection fraction for the most part. All right. Left ventricular ejection fraction of lower than 45% will be tagged heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So this is an additional disease identifier specific for heart failure reduced ejection fraction. I'm using 45% here because, you know, sometimes um, you see places where 40 is used. And I feel, I feel like that is very confusing. Some people will talk about heart failure with intermediate, improved, and all of these things. But practically in clinical medicine, it's difficult to make decisions with those type of terminology. So 45 is a good number, less than 45, heart failure reduced ejection fraction, 45 and up, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now coming to heart failure reduced ejection fraction, one of the first things you want to rule out especially if this is new onset heart failure uh, 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 with reduced ejection fraction, is to make sure you do an ischemic workup. Rule out acute coronary syndrome, coronary artery disease, because if you're treating heart failure reduced ejection fraction and you're not taking care of that, a lot of times you're probably just treating to waste. 
because the underlying reason why the heart failure exists, you're not managing that. And then, you know, it creates more problems for the patient. Um, ischemic workup, you don't necessarily jump and go and do a cardiac catheterization. Uh, you also, first of all, want to get EKG, all right, and cardiac enzyme troponins. All right, EKG and troponin will be very useful uh, for those patients. And if it's, it's clearly, um, uh, uh, what's it called now? significant, you want to go further and do cardiac catheterization, left heart catheterization. I think for the most part, with most patients with neon onset heart failure, uh, reduced ejection fraction, there's an indication clearly to try to get a cath within, you know, 12 to 24 hours of that hospitalization. It just helps you manage more comprehensively. Now, outside of ruling out coronary artery disease and uh, acute coronary syndrome, um, there are a lot of medications in addition to the in addition to the symptomatic control with diuretics there's a lot of medications that will provide you know mortality benefits uh, we call them GDMT all right goal directed medical therapy or guideline directed medical therapy um, the first one on that list would be the ACE inhibitors or the ARBs all right the arterial dilators, they make it easy for the heart to pump, and ultimately they prevent cardiac remodeling and they, 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 they have mortality benefit, meaning they don't allow the patient to die earlier. Um, there, there's a specifically <laughs> specific brand uh, or version of the ACN, uh, uh, ARBs, which is Entresto, um, that's Secubitril and Valsartan. Um, you don't necessarily want to start with that. Why? Some insurance don't cover it. All right, uh, uh, is, it might be more expensive for the patient. The ideal thing is to start with a single individual ACE or ARBs, and then if you've done all the rest of the medication on that list and you're not getting any significant uh, uh, improvement, you can then jump to interest. But if the patient's insurance covers it, you might as well go ahead and start with it. Um, beta blocker will be the next you know uh, uh, medication on that list that provides mortality benefit. Uh, 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 and obviously, it's, it's, it's uh, guideline directed. Beta blocker in this case with heart failure reduced ejection fraction, specifically, if you had to be specific, will be toprol. Toprol is metoprolol succinate. Metoprolol succinate. And that's one that was used in most of the trials uh, for this. It's a once a day medication. Um, SGLT2 uh, inhibitors are like the buzz of the 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 uh, of town nowadays because you know they they just do everything apparently um but uh here they they they're not indicated here for diabetes management they're indicated clearly here for the heart failure reduced ejection fraction meaning patients don't even have to die, have diabetes as long as they have a diagnosis of heart failure reduced ejection fraction sglt2 inhibitors can help these patients and provide mortality benefits uh the aldosterone uh, antagonists are also useful here. Um, they were looked at in the RAILS trial and for specifically in this case for severe heart failure, reduced, reduced ejection fraction of lower than 35% of New York Heart Association 3 and 4. Verisigward is a newer medication, not very commonly used, but it was uh, seen in Victor Victoria trial, Victoria EF trial, um, again, for heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, ejection fraction lower than 45%. Um, it's a guanylate cyclase inhibitor, if I'm, if I'm uh, correct. But there's a bunch of medications. Important thing here, if a patient has hyperkalemia, if a patient has hyperkalemia, angioedema from ACE inhibitors, ARBs, you cannot use the ACE inhibitors there or the ARBs, all right? Bidil, by two dilators, hydralazine and isosorbate dinitrate, all right? These are uh, 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 preferred uh, alternatives in patients with angioedema, hyperkalemia, or very bad renal failure. Uh, these, were, these are believed, based on data, uh, in the early 90s to be preferred in African-American population, but still they're not first line. They're not first line. They're an alternative. But if you have an African-American patient, it just works better in that case then. Um, finally, if you switch over to this side with uh, left ventricular ejection fraction of more than 45%, where we're dealing with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there are not many medications that are clearly uh, provide mortality benefits. So the main the main focus will be optimizing patient's blood rate, blood pressure, and heart rate. 
Um, spironolactone specifically was looked at in the TOPCAT trial and that, you know, there it, it was suggested that it might have some mortality benefit in these patients, but it's not, again, it's not commonly used. Um, I would, you would see it thrown some, sometime down the line with, when patients is having recurrent uh, admissions for heart failure with pres preserved injection fraction, but again, it's one of the considerations you should definitely have it in mind. HGLT2 inhibitors also are starting to, you know, have a buzz with heart failure with preserved injection fraction. Remember, I said they can do they do everything, um, but these medications are still in some of the preliminary trials. It's not it's not established established yet, but it's one of the things I think down the line, you just use it for everybody. Diabetes, half failure, reduced ejection fraction, half failure, preserved ejection fraction, and every other disease. But anyways, um, this is my short take, short, very short take on um, heart failure, conceptualizing the disease from the data that you initially get from history, physical exam, um, imaging and labs, to going to the things that you do initially to then further delineating, reduce ejection fraction, preserve ejection fraction, and what you do in each scenario. I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye.